Welcome to Analyst Talk with Jason Elder. It's like coffee with an analyst, or it could be whiskey with an analyst reading a spreadsheet, linking crime events, identifying a series, and getting the latest scoop on association news and training. So please don't beat that analyst and join us as we define the law enforcement analysis profession one episode at a time. Thank you for joining me. I hope many aspects of your life are progressing. My name is Jason Elder, and today our guest has 12 years of law enforcement analysis experience with 35 years of law enforcement experience overall. He spent time as an FBI intelligence analyst. He is now a retired senior special agent from the Department of Homeland Security. His uh, cases include national security investigations, financial crimes, intelligence, counterintelligence, protective investigations, and emergency management, just to name a few. He's a U.S. Army vet and holds a master's in public service and administration, homeland security track from the Bush School of Government. Please welcome Frank Lisondo. Frank, how are we doing? Good. How are you doing, Jason? I am doing well. I think I got that last name. I might have, I hope I didn't come off too cartoonish. I was really trying to announce it nicely there. Not at all. It's all good. <laughs> okay. Very good. All right. So we got a lot to go over. I really want to get into your experience as a federal analyst and get your perspective on training and teaching and the some of the deficiencies that you're seeing out there in the law enforcement analysis realm. So lots to go over. Let's start from the beginning, though. How did you discover the law enforcement analysis profession? Well, I found that while I was working as a as an agent, much like my time in the military, if you wanted any analytic work or any actual information advantage, you had to do the work on your own. And so the way the military did it, it completely differed from how a professional criminal intelligence analyst actually did things. Some of it was similar, but it was it was quite different. So I spent a lot of time learning the trade and the craft, and then gradually, much to the chagrins of other, other agents, I started to move more into the analytic role, becoming an, <laughs> an analyst, getting certified and everything else, just because if you, at the time, back in the in, in the 80s, if you 90s, you wanted if you wanted any anal, analytic support, you had to do the work yourself. So, or go to DC headquarters mm-hmm. where they had all the great analysts. So that's actually how I got into it. I decided I, I wanted the folks that were out in the field to have the same advantage as leadership had at headquarters, and so I just kind of rolled into the analytic role. Right. So, th- were you doing intelligence when you were with the army? So, with the military, I was actually part of you know combat arms track, mm-hmm. but then I had switched over to intel. I started doing psychological operations when it was part of the Intel branch before it became part of the Special Operations Command. And then I continued to develop my Intel skills, not only by going to more analytic tradecraft classes, but also going to the counter Intel class, going to the human collection course, just picking up every every bit of of information I could um, and every every skill I could I could perfect. So mm-hmm. throughout the military as as they were professionalizing and, and the, the tradecraft was emerging it, it was just a perfect opportunity to be able to pick up those skill sets and, and get some training and develop a network because we, we had a lot of great contact with law enforcement agencies, both federal and, and local law enforcement off, uh, officers and intel agents and intel analysts and intel agents for different law enforcement organizations. And so we were able to pick up and glean a lot of that information. So in the military, that's where I started picking up those skills, but then navigating over, like I said, to the criminal intelligence uh, it was it was a little different because you know <laughs> you, you couldn't violate people's rights there were a lot of oh by the way when you do this query here's all the three things you need to do to ensure you're not violating this person's civil rights or civil liberties oh and here's the rights these corporations and companies have which again was completely alien to me coming from DOD <laughs> so it was a learning curve I'll, I'll be honest with you I think so many people underestimate that but it, it was a learning curve yeah and I've heard the same from other folks that transferred from the military to law enforcement in the public sector. You would think that there's some similarities, but where there are differences, it's like, it's very glaring. Yes, yes. No, I mean, I, I always take my hat off to folks that, that are willing to to transition over as long as they're, they're open-minded and, and they come in with that perspective of, I'm going to learn a new trade. Like I said, I, I actually enjoyed my time in the military. It was a great time for me. <laughs> However, I will say I am a, a, a proud veteran, but I also don't stand behind. I don't, I don't, I used to tell other veterans, hey, great, you accomplished a lot of things. What are you doing right now? 
mm-hmm. and, it, and most professionals take it the right way. And that's, I'm just trying mm-hmm. to remind them. It's like, yeah, great. You have all the experience and knowledge. Now let's make it current. Let's make it relevant to what we're working now. So it's always been a great aspect that I picked up the lifelong learning mm-hmm. bug. And, and mm-hmm. I think that's what it takes to be a critical thinking professional, which is why I, I gravitated towards the analytic work as an, as an analyst, because you, 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 you're playing chess with, with everyone and that's a, it's a great opportunity to really become an independent critical thinker. Good. And so let's get into that. So you're, you're starting there. You, you're in DC. That's, that's big time, right? That's where everybody <laughs> is. And you're starting out as an Intel analyst and you got a little bit of growing pains that you mentioned there. What, yep. what are you doing? Like, as you just starting and what, what types of tasks are you doing? What, what do you remember as those first, first couple of months starting on the position? Well, I, I was kind of given a little bit of grace. I was allowed to work a lot of national security investigations and then a lot of things that had to do with transnational threats. And then as I started to improve and get a little more drilled down, get a little more polish, as my boss used to say, it's like, hey, Here's a, here's a little polish. We, we, mm-hmm. we want to show you how to improve yourself. So once I got a little more polished, I got to really work a lot of transnational criminal organizations, specifically everything from narcotics to currency fraud to individuals that were smuggling aliens, folks that were sometimes backed by foreign countries or other things that were trying to deal with dual commodity assets and things like that. So that's kind of when I started to really get more into the investigative or, or law enforcement support role because... Mm-hmm. A lot of these drug trafficking organizations or alien smuggling groups, they're they're very similar to working at that national level at DOD, but there's a lot of nuances because you're dealing with different jurisdictions and, and having to deal with different law enforcement agencies and the rules of, of evidence, and you don't want to ruin or mess up any, any prosecutional efforts that they're going with. So again, as I got a little more polished, I really got to, to sink my teeth into those cases. Hmm. So as you're working these cases, how much is... What's the balance or what's the maybe what the what's the percentage of it's a desk job, you're studying, analyzing data versus out in the field beyond the desk, getting into maybe surveillance or sitting in on interrogations or stuff beyond the data? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Believe it or not, we were we, we back back in the nineties, it was the wild, wild west. We were <laughs> Criminal intel analysts were part of the interview and interrogation team. We didn't just mm-hmm. come up with questions to validate the information of a confidential informant. A lot of times we would question them. And because of my language capabilities and skills and having spent so much time overseas, when they'd have some of these special interest aliens or some of these aliens that had apparent military training or experience from other countries, I was actually the lead interviewer and interrogator sometimes, mm-hmm. whether they're in custody or not in custody. We got to go out and help set up the, the surveillance and everything else. I mean, obviously, once I transitioned to analyst role, it was still a safer environment, but we were in the field. Mm-hmm. And then over the years, you started to see the over over, I call it the over domestication or the over office syndrome where you start to ha- have all these analysts and they weren't being trained and they weren't being trusted enough to participate in those field activities. And yeah. then fast forward to a lot of bad tragic events and other things and just segregation and, and, and misunderstanding of, of the fact that because the analyst wasn't involved in the day-to-day operational roles of what officers or agents were experiencing, they weren't intuitively thinking about the things that would advance the case or further, or think of things that maybe the investigator wouldn't wouldn't have thought of because they were so far removed. And mm-hmm. so, you know, even with, with, with the Bureau, while I was still there teaching, when they, when they started to develop the basic training programs and, and initial programs, they started to actually put the analysts and the agents together along with the support personnel, the language analysts and all these other financial analysts and everything else, they, they all come together at one point in time in the initial basic training. The reason being is because now they all know what what, you, what everyone's role is. And we started to develop policy to allow analysts to go back out into the field to be direct participants in not just formulating questions, but actually being able to sit in and hear the audio or, or witness it. So it's going back. We, we, we started one way. We lost all that and became very suits and ties and <laughs> office chairs. And the most exciting thing we did was roll our chair to the water cooler and, and back <laughs> to now we're seeing that transition, folks getting back into it. I think state and local law enforcement agencies have done a better job of, of advancing and getting the analysts back out 
with the investigators for interviews, being able to monitor surveillance, being able to listen directly to the audio of recorded interviews or interactions just so they can interpret it a little bit better, especially if they if they have a language skill or, or cultural capabilities. Federal is still a little behind the curve. It's not like it was, like I said, when I, when I first started where we went out with the agents and the investigators and we participated and we knew what they were doing. So I think I'd like to see that continue and, and progress and, and hopefully get more folks, more analytic personnel out in, in those roles instead of stuck behind a, a screen or, or behind a stack of paper. Yeah. And I, I think there's a lot to glean from all that. And it's really the analyst can take what they're observing from those out of office events and then come back to the office and see what they can find in the data that either supports or or doesn't support what what they're thinking. And yep. so it's just a whole other experience that they're being exposed to more information other than data that will just come allow them to come back to the office and see what they can find in the data. No, actually, Jason, that's that's a perfect point. One of one of the the, the examples of exactly what you're talking about to encourage this is is when I'm teaching classes and I'm, and I'm talking to leadership and managers about the need to integrate and have everyone working side by side is I give an example where an analyst is given the transcripts and translations, but they weren't participating in what was going on. And when the uh, individual says that this person is bad, the analyst just interprets that as what the notes were from from the from the translator, which is that the person obviously was was crooked or, or not a good source or was going to turn on on the officers. When that came uh, out during the briefings and everything else, they started to basically close this this confidential informant. And that's when another analyst who was working more closely with the actual investigative agency came out for the briefing along with the investigative agents. And they said, no, 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 he has a bad hand, meaning he had a prosthetic hand. Mm. And so there was just that, that, that nuances, those little things that were missed because the analyst wasn't directly involved and because that analyst was involved in, in confidential human sources and other things. They were recommending closing it, closing the the confidential informant who was providing great resources and advances, multiple cases, simply because they weren't out there working with with those agents and those field analysts. And so I always tell people, it's like you miss so much in context and and real life things because you're not you're 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 500 miles away in a nice air conditioned office. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about the data side now Mm -hmm. of of the position. One of the things that I feel with, and this mainly goes with the military into dealing with uh, law enforcement, is I feel that the military, there is so many written reports. Yes. And there's so much to read and consume and as an analyst to be well read up on all the different reports that are being being produced. I feel like especially once you get to the local police department level that there is really few and far between number of reports. I mean there will be case reports, but there won't be reports just written on particular topics or I feel there's not as much written that an analyst can consume. So I guess in terms of when you're an analyst here and starting out in the 90s, what side of the spectrum was it in terms of the data that you had access to? Yeah, no, those are great points. I think when 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 we when I first got started in the 90s and everything else, as as things were progressing, we had exactly what you're talking about. We had the investigative reports. We had the uh, the the local officers. Patrol officers' initial report we had to quarry. We basically had to make sure we were reaching out to our fellow departments and trying to track everything down and get that knowledge. And of course, fast forward now to all of the data set systems. So while individuals now find themselves in a rich environment of all this, all of this raw data, statistical data, I always caution people. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's great. You have all that statistical data, but what's the context to it? Because it was actually easier for us in the 90s when there was less information that was available. We had to scrounge for it because we were able to get the context. Where was it developed? How was it developed? What was the quality? 
of information. How is it collected? Is it very, is it firsthand, secondhand? We were able to do all that quality of information check. We were able to do all the, 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 the key assumptions checks and all these other things that go into the analytic work. And in the front end, when we were collecting this data and tracking it down, and now because it is a, a data rich environment, a lot of the shortcomings I find now is that people pay too much credence to this to these raw numbers or all this raw dat, data, and they're not looking at well, how was it collected? Where was it collected from? What's what was the context of it? How did it how did it, how did, it, how did it, was it derived? What agency supplied it and other things? Well, analysts aren't thinking about that, and and neither is leadership or management. They're just taking these raw specific numbers, and that's what they're regurgitating without mm-hmm. value any of it so it's it, it's 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 kind of a of a hot button for for those of us that have been around for a long time because we like to tell people uh, an independent critical thinker or a critical thinking professional which is what a criminal intelligence analyst is or any type of analyst is has to be able to ascertain where the information came from what the validity of it is before they start to move forward because as an analyst your job is not to be the weather person and and give what the statistics little data points at your job is to provide actual context so that your end consumer, the agency you're working for, has an information advantage when they're making their decision. It's funny. I'm going to plug a, a special show that's upcoming on the on the podcast. Uh-huh. I am working with Randy Stickley, and he is he and I are working on a podcast show before you leap, which mm-hmm. is, talks about critical thinking and all the different biases that law enforcement analysts can come across and we we were just talking about this idea of critical thinking and Mm -hmm. what you what you produce and one of the points that i made is is when you have when analysts have only limited sources they have lots of holes in their what what they can see that can lead to the need for more critical thinking, more creative thinking, but it also can lead them to stick their neck out a little bit. And yeah. they may not be comfortable with doing that. So some folks just pull back and just, okay, here are the facts type of right. thing without giving that context that you just mentioned. Yeah. I think you're so right. I was actually having a conversation not that long ago with, with Jim Berganti. He used to be one of the assistant directors for the the Bureau's Intel division as far as helping advance things. Now he's he's actually helping teach a lot of these these things for the Defense Intelligence Agency as well as the, the National Intelligence University and a few other law enforcement agencies. And one of the things we were discussing is exactly those points in the sense that too often analysts find themselves not understanding because they they haven't been trained and the and and the critical thinking and and the analytic skills have not been reinforced in them in the sense that they don't realize that when you're lacking information or missing information, that's your indicating in, indicators and your indicators is a, is a is a structured analytic technique method that actually says when you're when when you're missing information you actually are in a information rich environment. You don't, you should not be scared because there's a lack of information or there isn't sufficient numbers or there isn't enough reporting. It's okay. Why isn't it reported? What are we missing? How do we fix it? Where's the shortcomings? To coin, to coin a phrase, everyone used to make fun of Mr. Ronfield for saying, you know, we, we don't know what we don't know until we know what we don't know. And it's, it's a running joke in the Intel community because we would always, we were always taught in the eighties and the nineties that when there's minimal to no reporting you actually have more information than you think you just got to look you have to have as you point out that confidence in your critical thinking skills in your analytic capabilities and in your ability to be able to discern are are you the victim of, of denial and deception is this a tactic or a skill that's being utilized by the adversaries that you're working against so, so many people think that these low level criminals are not capable of, of these skills, but every time you go to jail, you're, you're, you're getting more and more educated and you're coming out and you're using the new skills that you're picking up from, from your fellow inmates to make <laughs> your work basic crime even more sophisticated and more nuanced. And so we see it all the time and it doesn't matter whether it's a car jacking ring or if, or, or whatnot. Sometimes when you don't have that information, you actually are, are swimming in a bunch of information. You just, like you said, have to have the imagination 
and the critical thinking skills and the confidence to, to say, hey, I know what I'm looking at, to realize when there is a lack of information, you're actually swimming in a lot of information. Hmm. So let's, let's build on that a little bit, because I think what, what comes to mind when you say that, and this is one of my shortcomings when I was an analyst starting out, and is that I would be tied to that desk and mm -hmm. I didn't necessarily have the confidence or maybe didn't even think it was my job to to go beyond that, to, to get there and, OK, let's if I don't have it, let's go get it. Let's go find it. And that that's going beyond the data that might be finding the right person to talk to or finding mm -hmm. the right scenario to to gather the information that we're asking for. And it, this gets back to what we originally saying in terms of outside the, the office mm -hmm. events that we were talking to. But I mean, I guess just let's elaborate that on there and the stuff that, you know, you would recommend or you you did what, during your time as an analyst. Well, honestly, what what it comes down to is, like I said, I was very fortunate to have a lot of training, probably mm -hmm. probably over and inundated with training. And so because I had that opportunity to train, I had an opportunity to network. And that's the thing. Every time you attend any tra training, look around. Don't don't be a bubble. Mm -hmm. Don't just sit there with the folks you came from or came with from your department. Talk to everyone because you're going to establish that network. That network of people are going to teach you things you never knew. And they're also going to be folks that you're going to be able to reach out to who you've met face to face who are going to remember you and are going to help you provide that information. The other key thing is because, again, this was the wild, wild west in the, in the early 90s. <laughs> We call these gaps investigative leads. And, and I think I have found over the years, because you have so many people coming from DOD or academia that are being hired in as, as intel analysts or even in private industry, they don't have that measure of experience to go into it. And so they just call it information gaps or they, they call them information needs. What they don't realize is in the, in, the, in the criminal intelligence world, when we're dealing with criminal adversaries or, or individuals that are doing not so nice things to other people, what we refer to as undesirable activities or undesirable events, um, these are investigative leads. When you find that you're lacking certain information, you don't go to someone and say, hey, I'm missing this information. How? You say, hey, I have an investigative lead for you. How would you how would you try and fill this 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 knowledge gap? And a lot of agents and investigators will actually take it as a challenge and say, hey, great, that's a great lead. I didn't think of that. Let's expand that investigation. When I was overseas teaching fellow law enforcement agencies how to do these rapid turnarounds for for kidnapping cases that they had very complex, very whatnot in Central and South America, we realized that these gaps were always there because the, the adversary was always refining or improving how to hide their stuff. So we started framing it again as an investigative lead. And these officers started taking it as a challenge to say, hey, I'm going to fill that gap. I'm going to go out and I'm going to run down this information. I'm going to track this down. And through that investigative lead terminology, it became that coexisting concept, concept of where that criminal analyst can now speak to not only their network that they've been to for training and professionalism and everything else, but they can also leverage the investigative team and say, hey, we need, we're missing this information. What color? The eyewitness reported that on the south side reported that the vehicle was white. On the you know north side, they reported the vehicle was black. Do we have any other angles? What investigative leads do we have from the east or the west as far as the, the side of the or the the color of the vehicle, make model, or other things? They sound very innocuous, but that mm -hmm. is that investigative lead that, that helps direct those efforts to fill that information gap and advance that case. Because I mean, that's the difference between a criminal analyst. And a national security analyst, a national security analyst can be working a question that will never get answered, where a criminal analyst is working to answer a question that's going to lead to prosecution or the disruption of a, of, of an organization. Mm -hmm. I, and I think, again, I'm thinking back throughout my own career is I was comfortable in the data. And so that's right. where I, that's where I was and that's where I stayed. But this concept of going and even interrogating somebody. Uh -huh. That, that to me is such a foreign concept yeah. is such is so outside my comfort level to go in and and question somebody. I never did it, obviously, just, but it's just to me, it's so abstract. It's, it's hard for me to wrap my head around. 
and uh, and that's just going to come down to training. And and I also say have to caveat with it also it also depends on the comfort of the analyst because you don't want an analyst working outside of his or her comfort zone. You want them to work within the confines of their comfort zone so that they can feel relaxed and they can work for them. But training has a lot to do with it. The inquisitive mind, which is one of the main staples of, of, of any analyst or anyone undertaking analytic work, wants to learn and grow. And so given the opportunity, had you sat through all the structured analytic classes, had you had a little more creative with critical thinking, had you had some of the what if or quadrant analysis or future wheels or, or other training, and then had seen these gaps for this investigative information and, and then given an opportunity to participate in something as simple as maybe the read interview and interrogation technique, you probably could have felt really comfortable beginning in writing interview or questions and then as those inter- as you start to develop your confidence in those interview questions based on what was being brought back from the agent or the officer that was conducting the, the, the interview of, of the subject or, or, or the witnesses, you would actually start to develop that, that confidence saying, well, I can ask this question myself because that might lead to this and lead to this. Because now you're, you're, you start to develop that parallel response where it's like, okay, let me develop an argument map. Here's my question. If they answer A, then I'm going to go to B. If they answer D, I'm going to go to E. You know, so now instead of having to go back and forth what, by writing these 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 interrogatory questions for the investigator to ask, because you you you're doing that 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 future casting, you're doing your you know your future wheels, your your what ifs, your alternatives, your quadrant crunching, you're 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 doing your ACHs and and everything else while you're thinking and 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 writing up these investigative lead questions. You're, you're anticipating, well, if they answer this, then this should be the next three questions. If they answer this. So after a while, the agent's going to just look at you or the officer's going to look and say, why don't you come in and ask the question yourself? <laughs> and that's really, and as your comfort level, and that's really how it started in the 90s. Mm-hmm. That's what it was. I had, we had all these questions. We had all these things. That's really what ended up happening. An officer looked at me and said, hey, just come in and ask the questions yourself. You, you, you've got so many of them. And then you have contingent questions to, to responses. Just come in and get it over with. And it made it seamless and it made it smooth. Of course, again, I had the benefit of that training where because my department or my agency was allowing me to go into that 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 support role in the field, they're like, well, you need to be prepared for these things. So even though, even though I had had agent training, I was actually given more training as an analyst when it came to interviewing and interrogating people and other things and, and whatnot because of all the other structured analytic techniques and critical thinking techniques that I haven't had had already mastered and was able to do internally instead of having to do on a big whiteboard. And that just comes from training, practice, and and failure. Hey, this is Freddie Croft, Lieutenant with HPD. My public service announcement is to encourage people to get a T model of skill acquisition. Learn a broad set of skills across many different things and then find one that interests you and dive deep into that. Learn and become a subject matter expert in it. Doing that will allow you to be extremely successful in your career. Hello, I'm Barry Fosberg, the senior analyst with Houston Police Department. I'm here to do a PSA for regional associations. If you're an IACA or familiar with IACA, get in, find out if you have a local association, and if for no other reason... Your crooks don't know you have borders. Your borders typically have other crime analysts, and this is a great way to know them by name. My name is Shannon Kale. Please stop clipping your fingernails in the office. The sound is annoying, and no one wants a fingernail to come flying into their workspace. Keep the grooming routine in your home. Keep the workspace clean and free of fingernail debris. Thank you. I approve this message. So I'm, I'm curious, you talked about training and about how, how beneficial it was. As as you're with your time as an analyst, uh, can you maybe a, a time what you trained didn't match with practice? Meaning that like, oh, the training's telling me to do X, but I'm reading the room and I can tell I should not do X. (laughs) 
Yeah, you know, that's that's the skill of, of any good Intel analyst. You've got to be able to, to, to read the room. You've got to be able to to be brave enough to, to do the right things. I, I don't know how many times I would go in and do a briefing at the director's level at the bureau or, or, or somewhere else where everyone's scared of leadership. And it and I would just walk in and say, hey, look, these are the facts. Now, you may know something I don't know, but based on what we've done, these are the facts. This is this is this is what what what's transpired. Here's how we developed that information. Here's where we what we believe or what I believe is is the potential impact or ramifications. And here's recommendations of future courses of action in order to remedy this. And I cannot tell you how many times you get grilled. You got to be able to stand there and you got to be able to take it. And, you, and you're going to get grilled and you're going to get challenged because again, a senior executive knows multiple things about multiple programs that may impact or have a derivative on yours that you're not aware of because you're working in your own little compartmental zone and you just have to have that confidence. I get it. It has always come, come it, it, it's always come out where even where, where I, and it sounds like kind of a, a, a bad dad joke, but even where I was wrong, I ultimately ended up being right because I stood my ground and I stood behind my, my analytic work and I stood behind my team and Luckily, because I had faith in them, we we were actually able to to overturn the the prevailing analytic line from other agencies, where five other agencies in the Intel world were reporting X, Y, and Z. My group was reporting the complete opposite, and it and it ended up being because of the confidence in in our training, our skills, and our professionalism, we didn't waver, and that's what led to success. And one of the things I find is today. So many people have become such, as you were speaking to earlier, have become so so contingently attached to to raw data. They're not doing any 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 actual analytic work. They're just they're just sticking to the numbers. They're just sticking to the information. And so a lot of times they're not providing that that information advantage for for the decision maker in their decision process. And so that's where you start to see the erosion in confidence and leadership with the analysts. And so all, all the training I've had comes back to, they've been doing intelligence and analytic work has, has, has been going on since the, the late 1930s, early 1940s. And it's just changed in names and, and structure and, and whatnot. But if we remember the basics and we just continue to retool it and, and make it current, we'll, we'll, we'll have that ability to be able to stand there, read the room and, and know, hey, I understand this is not a popular opinion, but that's not what we what we see. And you just got to be able to stand behind it and support it, having faith in your team, yourself, and your skills. So you mentioned it's 90s, but obviously 9-11 occurs and everything oh, yeah. changes. Oh, absolutely. So I guess from from your perspective, or maybe you, you, maybe you have a unique perspective on how 9-11 changed your position. Yeah, I mean, honestly, our, our my position or the criminal intelligence position all all really started changing after the before 9/11 and before the the a lot of the failed attempts by Al Qaeda when when Tim blew up the Murrow Building in Oklahoma City. That's when criminal intelligence really started to change because we found that there was a lot of shortcoming and we found that there were a lot there was a lot of lack of communication, and there were also there was also a lack of professionalism. We had forgotten so much about. The, the the true analytic skills, the cr- true critical thinking skills, much like you were saying before you leap, what are what are what are what are you what are, you, what are your, your what are, what does your critical thinking hat say is going on? Let's let's fall back on some of these structured analytic techniques. Let's fall back on on some of these abandoned skills in order to be able to to, to forecast a little bit better. And after the Oklahoma City bombing, a lot of things changed for the criminal analysts, both federally and state and local. And there was a lot of money. There was an influx, and then those lessons were lost. It became, for lack of a better term, it became a, a momentary uh, opportunity for organizations to receive money and 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 not do it, not do anything to really expand or extend or enhance the analytic capabilities. And then, like you said, 9/11 occurred, and 9/11 occurred, and it really re-emphasized all of the findings that had happened before. Agencies were were lacking imagination. Agencies. <laughs> didn't have the ability to the steadfast reporting of other agencies and question what other organizations were saying. They became so data driven that they weren't understanding what the what the context behind the data actually was. There was no interpretation efforts. It was they were simply not putting their necks out and they were just reporting 
that raw data and, and that raw information. And so after 9-11, every agency uh, started to change. You know, every federal agency changed. I mean, they, they, they essentially broadened and expanded the need for not just initial training in analysts on the federal side. And, and I can obviously speak more towards the federal side because that's where I was when 9-11 occurred. And so it was a retooling. It's like, y'all need to talk to each other. You all have to have confidence and faith in each other. Y'all need to train your folks on how to think critically and be independent critical thinkers and question everything, not to the point of subordination or insubordination, but to stand fast and be able to defend and argue what their analytic work is. And then you have to continue to train them. You have to reemphasize the basics and then develop it into intermediate skills and then teach advanced skills and then go back to the basics and then go back to the, to the, to the advanced skills. And so what 9-11 actually did is it created an environment where um, investigators had to know what analysts did and, 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 and know. And analysts need, needed to know what agents did or didn't do in order to become more intuitive in the process, become more aligned and more in step, as well as for each other to understand where the strengths and weaknesses were. And then also get past a lot of the misinformed conception. A lot of times, and I, I'm sure this, if you if you stop a, an analyst today and you say, hey, what do you think a, an FBI agent does or a DEA agent does or the local police does? Mm -hmm. They're going to tell you what they see on television. They're, and, and it's not very realistic because what someone can do on a, on a television show or in a movie with a million, multi-million dollar budget is extraordinary. As an analyst, I wish I had the capabilities that some of these TV shows indicate that we have. So you get you just got to work with some of these arcane systems, and and that's where the big changes were. We're like, hey, we're going to train our folks to be able to do this without these computers, without this software, without this over reliance on data, and and that's really the biggest change after 9/11. What about? I, I know again, I'm going back to some of the training that I remember during this time, and the the Patriot Act comes through, and. Right. And th that can be a lightning rod. But what I remember one of the things that they taught in about the Patriot Act is it gave a pathway to exchange information between Absolutely. all the different layers, whether it's state, local, federal, military, yep. or CIA, whatever it is that there was before 9-11, there wasn't necessarily an easy way to streamline and to pass on information, but the Patriot Act kind of softened that and gave this new standard operating procedure of how to pass data through. Yeah, no, absolutely. So what you ended up seeing is uh, prior to 9-11 to and the Patriot Act and some some of the other uh, things, exactly what I had mentioned earlier, when you went when you go to training or you work with another um, officer, another analyst, you you get to know them face to face and they're they're your your resource. And so you're only sharing information with your network. And when you retire or leave, it's lost. That institutional relationship goes away. So at what the Patriot Act decided or found was it's best to have a process that adheres to all the rules and CFRs to ensure that every agency is within scope of how they handle it, address a lot of shortcomings that had happened before when after the, the, the Oklahoma City bombing happened. And a lot of people's rights and, and, and liberties were violated by different departments. And, and I'm not going to say it was a good or a bad thing. I think it was it was well intended. They had the, the, the right motivation, but there was a lot of information they were collecting on people that wrong or right should not have been collected or stored the way it was. And so a lot of these code of federal regulations and all these rules and state legislators passed all these rules. And so what the Patriot Act essentially did is it created networks like RiskNet, networks like HISN, and, and networks like it's called Leo now, it used to be called Leap, where agencies could, could verify who they were and get on there and, and, and share information. And then they were able to share that information through the, the different networks and, and, and direct systems. And the nice thing about that is it ensured that when information or reports were put in or information about individuals or, or organizations or corporations were put in there, it had a, a default system that ensured that the civil rights and civil liberties of those of those entities or individuals were being protected, even though it was being shared between multiple agencies or whatnot. It just made sure that all the rules were being followed. Had an internal auditing system, 
And whenever there was a red flag or any questions, then someone would come down and visit with those departments and make sure everything was on the up and up. If somehow it ran afoul, they would write a report, do an inquiry, develop a policy to, to, to prevent it from happening again, retrain the personnel, and then move along about their business. And so you see now a lot of these established systems for information sharing between agencies and organizations have actually started to collapse or erode. People don't want to use them. As a lot of the folks either retire or move on, you have this new incoming group of, of intelligence professionals and leaderships who haven't worked in the intel world or haven't worked in law enforcement, but they're great managers and they're great organizers, and they're moving or gravitating towards different platforms or different things that are not well established and are not well adhered and they're they're not they haven't been established so they're not in compliance with a lot of the cfrs and protections and so now one of the big things i've seen is that to your point a lot of the data free if the the capabilities to to freely share data and information back and forth has been eroded because you don't have as many agencies wanting to participate they want to establish their own new kingdom and their own little fight them and let's face it they're right now 2023 2024 you, I can one wholeheartedly say that most departments or large departments now have gone back to the mentality that information is power. The information, the more information I can control, the more power I have all over the smaller departments around me. And I, and I see that as a as a shortcoming because it's just it's just establishing an opportunity for another catastrophic, undesirable event like 9/11 or the Oklahoma City bombing to occur again because. Instead of using these these established networks and platforms that are there, ready to available and easily to sign up for, they're trying to use, you know, reinvent the wheel and they're trying to use new systems. And I, I think it's a tragedy. So I probably answered a little more than I was supposed to, but you know, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully that you, you get the gist in the sense that yeah, after 9-11, there were there were some great and phenomenal systems that were put up. And what was great about it is it had a lot of insurances to, to make sure that the departments were never going to be out of scope on how they did things. But mm-hmm. now you're starting to see private entities being utilized as as conduits for a lot of these things. And these are private companies. They, they, they're not going to hold, they're not going to, you know, adhere or exonerate any department or establish any, any exculpatory aspects for it. And then again, a lot of these real-time fusion centers and, 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 and uh, makeshift emergency collaborative centers that are being established everywhere, they're not sharing with anyone who's not part of their of their group, meaning they're not participating in pain and stuff. And so they're trying to control that information so that they control have some some power over the purse. And and I see that as a shortcoming. Hmm. No, I can see that. It's it's funny. I often describe things in ways of like a pendulum swinging. And yes. that you if you wait long enough, the pendulum will swing back. Yes. <laughs> yeah, just I no. I don't know what it is, but there's so many examples where you just or you go from okay, strict to loosey goosey and it just kind of bounces back and forth that pendulum from time to time. And so it seems no. to me that that's that's not surprising to hear, unfortunately, that it's you get that that pendulum swinging back the other yeah, way. No. I agree with you. I was actually having a discussion with Michael Rupp. He's a he's a he's a a professor at Michigan State, and by trade he's an epidemiologist. But he's actually been in the criminal justice world uh, for for a very long time here in the, in the in the United States with with the uh, with Michigan State and everything else with a lot of their efforts that they've done to advance uh, the intelligence-related policing efforts and everything else. And he was he was calling to ask me about this this company that that has surfaced that is making inlets and headways with a lot of intel analysts and managers from different departments where it's a private company and what they're doing is they're setting up these round tables and they're 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 picking the brains of all these folks on how to develop a perfect private enterprise information sharing environment and so he called me and he goes hey frank what are what are some you used to investigate these people this stuff and used to actually have a regulatory compliance rule when you were at, at at the usic level and you would shut down these companies what are some of the shortcomings? I said it's a private company. The only people they that the only person that they adhere to is 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 the stake the shareholders and the investors. Ultimately, it doesn't matter if their clients are their clients. There there is never going to be a contract written that will indemnify the clients. It's always written in 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 in, in the advantage of the private company. So so they will set up a platform and they will always have the out that that they said 
they built it based on the in input of all their clients who participate in these round tables. And the problem is it's not Ristat, it's not Hisen, and it's not, you know, Leo, which means it's not, it doesn't have that audit trail. It doesn't have those safeguards. It doesn't have those built in ready controls to ensure that data is being secured the way the, the government has says it has to be inputted, controlled, managed, and, and, and protected shared by the process that that has been established through the Patriot Act and and expanded on by by state legislations, you know. And so we were talking about how if this comes to fruition, we're going to actually see the repeat of a very tragic event that happened years ago where a police department, there there are two captains that were responsible for intelligence and, 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 and other things, and then the chief of police, and then a few folks in the in in the mayor's office as well as the the, the commissioner's office all had to pay you know penalties because they were found not in scope based on the fact that they were using something very similar and so i think a lot of those institutional experiences have just been lost and, and i and I, I find it tragic that like you said that pendulum if you wait long enough it's it's kind of like the joke here in texas if you don't like the weather wait a minute yeah and, uh, and to your point in in using your analogy that pendulum unfortunately is swinging 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 to we're almost at the same point now as we were prior to 9 11 that helped facilitate all of the things that happened and transpired leading up to the World Trade Center. And I mean, again, I'm retired, I'm old, maybe maybe I see shadows and mm-hmm. and I, fair, 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 full, full disclosure, I am one of those what they call Cold War veterans. I learned the the, the Russian, you know, methods of, of combat and their tailing knee and their, their, their modes of operation and everything else, just like everyone else did in the military at the time. But I don't, I don't consider myself a cynic. I, I think of it as more of a realistic aspect that if if I was conducting an analytic um, process and using future wheels and future casting, or even if I was using LAMP, Lockwood's analytic method of, of predictability, I would have to say, hey, this is not faring so well. I see a lot of things from the past being repeated. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, I could talk about that for another hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That, but uh, we'll save I, that one for, for for the next conversation. Yeah, but I, I just to finish up your intelligence analyst career, you, as you get into instruction, and you talked about being a lifelong learner. Mm-hmm. I, I imagine being that lifelong learner, having that appetite to learn. Teaching when you teach something, it's it's like you learn it twice. I think there's a saying in there, yes. something like that. And and so I can imagine. As you're getting into more of the instruction, because of your appetite to learn, it, teaching was was natural to you. Yeah, no, teaching came really easy, especially when the bureau said, "Hey, we we need to start adhering to all these rules and stuff." Being able to switch gears and help develop um, and expand, because initially when it first happened, they just scrambled and reproduced a lot of old stuff, and then they said, "Okay, we need folks with with practical experience. Let's take the theory out." And let's 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 get someone who actually can do this, not just talk about doing it, but actually has done this over the career of their time. And so you, we started to see a lot of folks with with actual analytic background doing the work, coming into the, the training environment and helping rewrite a lot of the lesson plans and, and the curriculum and the scenarios so that it was more realistic and in line with those things that will really happen. It wasn't it was no longer theoretical, but it was now applicable and practical to what analysts and agents and support analysts and language analysts and financial analysts and other folks were going to actually be be exposed to running these real world cases luckily we were we, a lot of um district a lot of district attorneys a lot of u.s attorneys were very gracious enough to allow us to use true case true cases as long as we change certain things and we had to run it past them in order to be able to develop a lot of the scenarios. So we had a lot of very realistic training that was brought in there. And and to your point, being able to teach it, we learned new things from each iteration. And Mm -hmm. you learn good things and you learn bad things. But one of the best things that we learned is how to modify some of these, these methods and techniques taking ego out of it and not being on the quest of trying to change it just enough to so that we can have an opportunity to name it after ourselves but actually <laughs> actually make it where it was relevant and current to the to the environment of what where it's going to be utilized today and be able to expose it like i cannot tell you how often i would get into running discussions and arguments sometimes very heated arguments and debates with some very 
very highly educated um, theorist in the Intel world in the sense that, you know, everyone has heard of ACH, which is an analysis of competing hypothesis. The problem is that over the years, people have mis misconstrued and they've forgotten that there, there are actually two methods. You have analysis of competing hypothesis, and then you have alternative competing hypothesis. And what a lot of agencies teach today is alternative competing hypothesis. Well, when you teach alternative competing hypothesis, it's, it's anyone could have done it to include little green Martians. <laughs> and so it's very hard to defend that process if it becomes aware or it's disclosed during a prosecution of an individual or an organization. But if you use analysis of competing hypothesis, then you're actually taking all the potential who done it and why, motivational factors and everything else, and drilling that down in a very succinct, very structured, very analytic process where if it was to, to come to 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 fruition where it was made part of the escopatory information or, or, or potential, you know, evidentiary information enters courtroom and an analyst was to walk in and, and have to testify, they're going to be able to support and, and, and defend those, those analytic techniques. And so fast forward to today, now I'm retired and, and I'm asked to show up and, and, and teach at some of these law enforcement agencies and, and, and organizations. And I find very tragically that we're repeating that process of we're no longer training our folks to to be independent critical thinkers, but we're teaching them to utilize a database or a software system. And, and the mm. system does the thinking for them. And so they're not capable of externalizing all these things. If you ask them a question, they've got to go back to a terminal. And I'm like, no, 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 stop, come back. <laughs> all right, here's your information. It's like reading a newspaper. Here's all the facts. I'm going to tell you a story. This is the story. This is how you go. This is, this is what you're going to write when you go uh, this is what, what an investigator is going to present to a U.S. attorney to try and get charges either accepted or it's going to get deferred. And and so they're going to tell you a story. So here's the story. Here are all the facts as we have. Them. It's going to go in chronological order. And it's up to you to discern all the major pieces of evidentiary information or other things and then develop these these methods and, te and techniques and utilize your own independent critical thinking skills to be able to do this. And again, one of the first things I always tell people is the same thing I found myself saying 15 or, or 20 years ago when I first started teaching, you know, critical thinking professionals, and that's that the role of, a, of, of an analyst, any, any analyst is to be m more than just a newscaster or a reporter. Your, your, your job is to inform. You got to, you got to go beyond the theoretical. Here's what anybody can pick up a, a list of statistical numbers and say, here's what's wrong. But put it in context. Explain where it came from, how how it was developed. What are your confidence levels? What are, what what does it mean? What are the potential impacts? And how do I avoid them? And that that's that's the big key thing to this to this lifelong learning experience that I've had is is again utilizing your 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 analogy of that pendulum. You're seeing that pendulum swing in a sense that so many folks are becoming very very contingent and very very dependent on that anal those, those 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 quantitative numbers and those systems and they don't they can't do any analytic work without it and it, and it's kind of scary yeah but well, i think too and first i want to applaud the fact that there is even practical training <laughs> because i feel that there's so much one of my big soapboxes on this show is that there's so much lecture based training oh, yeah. out there in yeah. law enforcement yeah. analysis where you just go in there you go into a lecture hall and there's somebody presenting and they talk the whole time and the the audience the analysts are just consuming maybe some awareness and then they're right. going on with their day they're back to their office and there's right. not this hands-on uh, scenarios that you're talking about oh, yeah. but i do i do feel though that this this idea of relying on automated systems relying on computers programs databases is it, there's so much data there you talked yeah. about before in the 90s when it was a wild wild west you didn't have so much data and yeah. i feel that now now there is so much data and analyst whether they're the only analyst at a small police department where they're just assigned whatever the hot topic is of the day or maybe they're in a few fu infusion a fusion center right. in which they're playing whack-a-mole on whatever is the hot topic of the day 
I mean, they're con they're like focused on that particular task, and they don't just being able to be well read and study and be that subject matter expert and and to go in and be able to focus is just so difficult. No, I agree with you. So so back back in 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 the seventies and the eighties, most most Intel analysts were were experts in their portfolio. They were assigned a portfolio. They worked at portfolio to nauseum. They knew everything there was about it. They knew who the players were, what, what countries, what what organizations, the currency. They they it, it read like a bedtime story to them. And nowadays everything moves fast. Everything is rapid. But at my day, as an as a working analyst in a in a teaching analyst in a in a managing analyst at at DOJ, I had access to well over thirty two hundred networks for, for data. And I, and I had to be able to, to say with confidence that I had reviewed every, either all 3,200 or plus, or those networks that had the, the, the likelihood of, of having the most information pertaining to the narrow subject. So I, so I could ignore, I could not ignore the, the, the quantitative data. I could not ignore it. I, I had to be able to access it. I had to be able to do it in a timely manner. There were some times where you're given an hour and you're told a car will be here to take you and it could be a subject you never touched before. And you've got an hour to query all this data and, and reach out to all the individuals and peruse those things. And a lot of times it's that externalized capability of being able to, to take that data sets, not run it through a computer, but think independently and think critically to dissect it and, and drill it down and get through the most important pieces of information and, and bring yourself up to enough speed where you can, unfortunately, what happened to me a few times is show up and have to brief some very high level individuals on, on something that you hadn't touched or had never touched until two hours ago before you walked in that door. And it's possible. You just have to have the ability to, as you say, be able to externalize, get that thinking, drill down to the most important stuff, utilize those methods and techniques that you've, you've continued to work. And I always tell people, yeah, it's great to have the luxury of being able to work a portfolio for a very long time. But if you don't have that, that capability, then the next luxury you have is perfecting your critical thinking and your critical thinking abilities. Be able to go from big, broad picture external exercises where you're you're getting the information you're getting everything inundated with and then you're having to write it out on a big whiteboard and then it goes to a plotting paper and then it goes to an easel and then it goes to a notebook legal size then it goes to a normal small notebook and then it gets down to a sticky <laughs> then it gets down to the point where you can do all that in your head mm -hmm. and people always laughed at me when i said you can do this they're like you're insane it's not possible but as they get exposed to it as they practice these skills they're able to pick out these things all on their own and they become very proficient where, you know, we would teach this, this ability to the daily briefer for the director of the FBI. And, and many times the briefer is just our most charismatic, attractive, most professional looking person we can find. Mm -hmm. And they may be lousy analysts, but we train them on how to drill down and utilize these, these specific skills over and over and over where no matter what we throw at them, they can dissect it and they can look at the information and, and know these are the key pieces of information. Having having dealt with the director as many days as I have, this is what they're going to want to know. This is the information they have, have to have in my back pocket. And then sometimes they reach back and they get some follow-up information and then they, they walk in there and they very competently, very professionally put forth all of that briefing and it's, mm -hmm. they, they haven't touched it at all. Most of these, <laughs> these analysts have not worked in an analytic role. This is their last step to, to, to take a leadership role, being the briefer for the director of the FBI. And I got to give it to these folks. These, these men and women are, are just able to really drill down on those, those skill sets and, and be able to do that. Just that take something they've never touched or looked at have no clue, and then utilizing just those skills to, to be able to get down to the nuances and, and walk in there and competently and, and confidently brief it. So it's possible. <laughs>
<laughs> nice, nice, nice. You touched on it a little bit, but I do want to ask the question directly. There, I normally have segments on advice for our listeners. And mm-hmm. so whether it's a new, maybe a new analyst, an experienced analyst, just add on to it, any advice you have for our listeners. Best advice I can I can give to any senior leaders, any program managers, or any any professional analysts or fledgling wannabe analysts is don't be complacent. Don't don't rely on just raw data. Look at it all. Become an independent, critical thinking professional. Learn as much as you can. Start with the basic structured analytic technique methods, and then continue to grow. And if you're looking for a resource. One of the best resources I find for a fledgling analyst when they're first getting started to help develop those critical thinking skills is to go to the Critical Thinking Institute's website and start learning some of the basic aspects because the better you you practice these things, the better you learn these things and the more succinctly that you learn to move away from just raw data, the better you will be because that, that that quantitative data is very sexy. It's very easy. And, and a lot of people feel very confident uh, and comfortable relying on it. But a lot of times that information is wrong. So best advice I can give anyone is, is learn to not rely on that, that quantitative data and learn how to, how to be qualitative as well. And you're going to do that by improving your structured analytic techniques and methodologies and just work them and work them and work them until they're secondhand nature to you. All right. I got a very loaded question coming up, coming up for you. So, so we're going to do what if scenarios. So let's, let's say the, the president comes in and deems you the law enforcement analysts czar of mm-hmm. the United States and you're you're in charge of law enforcement analysis throughout the country. What are some of the things that you're looking to do? What, what, just off the top of your head, I know it's a loaded, loaded question it's, of, it's, of it's, it's, it's very question. heavy, but I'm just kind of curious off the top of your head, maybe what, what are some things that you would address? Uh, the first thing I would do is I'd make sure that I uh, got with every entity or organization and made sure that they went back to sharing information through whatever memorandums of understanding we needed to establish so that that direct participation and that regular flow of information when it comes to those things that pertain to criminal enterprises or, or fall within the realm of criminal intelligence um, or law enforcement intelligence or has a nexus to, to, to law enforcement. I want to make sure that everyone knows what we're looking for, is very clear on what we're looking for, and is sharing readily and and completely and happily. The second thing I'm going to do is I'm not going to do like Louis Fries and throw every computer I see into the dumpster, (laughs) but I am going to require my analytic professionals to be just that, analytic professionals. I'm going to ensure that they've got the, the skills, the training, and the capability, and the confidence, and the competency to be able to take on the analytic work that is their profession and I don't care if they're sitting in an automobile on a train subway aircraft sans any no access to any system they should be able to do their work no matter what and they should be able to to do it very very well the third thing I would do is I'd improve I'd get rid of the misconception that criminal intelligence analysts only are only criminal intelligence analysts and 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 they're just there to read alarms and reports and calls for service and other things in within the intel community and make sure that everyone realizes that no matter what type of analyst you are whether it's a criminal analyst national security analyst a dod analyst weapons of mass destruction chemical biological or or, or financial analyst you're you're part of the critical thinking profession so i would do everything i could to ensure that every entity and organization understands that we're all cut from the same cloth we're just as professional if not more than they are and then finally, I start to get back to some of those basic skills that we had in, in, in the 90s in the sense that if as long as the analyst is, is comfortable doing it, they're going to participate as much as they feel comfortable doing with the day-to-day activities and operations and investigations because that's the only way they're going to learn. We were talking about earlier how you became a a Russian house expert at the CIA by owning an, a part of that portfolio that dealt with just the, the, the Russian intel services. Well, 
we don't have that luxury in this world. And then the only way we're going to become proficient and knowledgeable about what we're dealing with is if we take a few day, a, a few hours out of our day. It can't be every day, but two, one day out of out of out of the month, have that analyst actually go out and participate in that those those write outs walk, going out to the communities looking at at what some of these what what the interview and interrogation process is how sitting in in those surveillance vehicles when they have an opportunity it's going to develop that 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 nuances of being able to intuitively anticipate what an investigator is going to need to advance their their casework and then vice versa do the exact same thing with those agents a lot of times when I'm teaching classes, I'm not just teaching now that I'm retired. I'm not just teaching structure analytic technique and critical thinking techniques and intelligence analytic methods to intel personnel, teaching it to law enforcement officers because these agencies have realized they need to make their officers aware of the information gaps so that they can be ahead of the curve and not behind it. So those are top ones, the, the top <laughs> few. I mean, I throw you a curveball and you hit a grand slam. Well, well done. Apologize. Full disclosure. I have, <laughs> I have had a few, a few roles that I have filled undisclosed because I usually don't, don't. I'm not very braggadocious and I don't care. But I, I've, I've been in a few leadership roles. I've had to defend this stuff to Congress before, and that's a bunch of lawyers. So I think I'm, I'm I've got a well, well laid out plan to move forward. The problem is nobody wants to listen. <laughs> Well, I certainly hope they do before we get another bad incident. That's for sure. I agree with you. So, all right. Well, let's finish up with personal interest. And you are a motorcycle rider. I am. I actually own a Indian motorcycle and I am an avid rider and I like to go on as many long trips as possible. Any opportunity I get to ride to a distillery or a brewery. <laughs> Well, um, nice. I don't ride with any groups or associations. I'm kind of one of those weird solo riders. However, I seem to get along with, with most groups that I come across. But the only patches you will find on my jacket or anything that I wear as far as protective gear are those from the, all the distilleries and or all the brews companies that I've been to and, and, have, and they sell patches. Oh, all right. So you're, it's like a bumper sticker. It's like yep. all the places that you've been. I got it. I like it. I like it. And so what farthest you've ever rode in one, one sitting? Uh, in one sitting, I was fortunate enough before the sunset to make it from the Houston, Texas area all the way to Tennessee. Oh, wow. Yeah. How, how, how many hours was that? It felt like ages on my backside. It had been a, a while since I'd done a long ride, but it was about 12 hours. All right. Very good. Well, our last segment of the show is Words to the World. This is where you can promote any idea that you wish. Frank, what are your words to the world? My words to the world is if, if you're in a role or an opportunity to be able to identify someone that you can mentor, train, and educate, and assist in developing them, do so. I'm a firm believer. People used to ask me all the time, what was my, 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 my greatest accomplishment when I worked full time before I retired? And that's it. I would sometimes identify a few people, two or three, and train them not just to do my job better than me, but to do my boss's job better than me and better than them. And that's, that's I think, a word, if, I, if I had any words to the world, find someone that you can help develop because they're the future. But sooner or later, we're all going to retire. We're all going to get a chance to do those long motorcycle rides or go fishing. <laughs> and that's my word of words, words of advice to the world. Find someone to mentor so that a lot of the institutional knowledge is not lost. Very good. Well, I leave every guest with you, giving me just enough to talk bad about you later. Absolutely. <laughs> but I do appreciate you being on the show, Frank. Thank you so much. Did you be safe? You do as well. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Have a great one, Jason. Thank you for making it to the end of another episode of Analyst Talk with Jason Elder. You can show your support by sharing this and other episodes found on our website at www.leapodcasts.com. If you have a topic you would like us to cover or have a suggestion for our next guest, please send us an email at leapodcasts at gmail.com. Till next time, analysts, keep talking.